video. I'm sorry. We're going. Hey, say it, James. Hey, what is up, guys? Welcome to Mr. Malenka's History of Review. Guaranteed for a five, that John Green crap is worthless. All he has is special effects. It is using his AP World History Teacher's Notes. I am, what did I say? Hey, John Green, whatever his name is, Nathaniel Green, General Revolutionary War, doesn't matter. And this is going to be embarrassing. I'm a real history teacher and I don't even know. You know why? It's why he's insignificant. I don't even know his name. And his books are depressing. He knows him. Fight it, John. So. I don't even care. Alright. They're not calling Adam Green? No, he said, like, you know John Green, uh, you don't know John Green's name, but you know Shooter Nahute's name. That's right. That shows you how insignificant he really is. I don't, John Green doesn't know who Shooter Nahute is. No, he does not. Who also doesn't know who that name is are the civilizations of Mesoamerica. Um, and we're going to start with the Mayas. Now, there are older civilizations in Mesoamerica than the Mayas. Um, the bedrock, the foundational empire in Mesoamerica, which think Mexico, are the Olmecs. How do we remember the Olmecs? Because they're from Old Mexico. And the problem with Mesoamerica is the early inhabitants, the Paleo-Indians and the AP speed, the nomads are going to cross the Bering Strait during the Ice Age. And as they begin to populate North America and work their way down to Mesoamerica and South America, the land bridge gave them access to get over here. Um, what's left of the um, Bering Strait are the Aleutian Islands, if you've watched the Dutch Harbor of an ice fisherman. They followed herds moving from Asia to North America. And when they got to the New World, they became very isolated. Some groups stopped, you know, the Inuits and Eskimos, and then people worked their way down the California coast and the Great Plains, and so they become Blackfeet and Sioux and Apache and Navajo. Pawnee and Shawnee, and if you're from Pawnee, Indiana, maybe even the Wamapoke Indians, all the way over to the Cherokee and the Great Iroquois League, and we work our way on down. As the Bering Strait melts, however, the people of the Americas are going to be cut off from cultural diffusion. They will be cut off from the developments between Africa, Europe, and Asia. So remember, the Chinese invent the wheel, but it makes it over to Mesopotamia via cultural diffusion. The great trade routes, the Silk Road, the Spice Road, the Trans-Sahara Gold and Salt Route, diffuses information. So the Americas are going to be about one to 2,000 years behind the rest of the world. They are going to do many of the exact same things. It is, however, just going to take them a little bit longer. And the geography is where we're going to start. The Mayan civilization grows on what is the Yucatan Peninsula. <laughs> if you envision Mexico as an arm flexing, the fist or the hand is the Yucatan Peninsula. If you've gone on a Caribbean cruise out of Tampa Bay, Miami, you know, New Orleans, Texas, it's where the big fancy resorts are, Cozumel, and places um, like that. You may have been to the ruins, you'll see Chichen Itza, Tulum, places um, of that nature. And the mines are this first big urban um, center. And the Yucatan is full of jungles, rainforest, mountains, and it runs from modern-day Mexico down into Central America and what we would call as El Salvador. We've got, you know, wild boars, we've got leopards, we've got deer, but it's in a very jungle-encrusted area. So you can see, being in a helicopter, there's this barely tops of ancient temples right there, swallowed by the jungle. It was just um, a year ago where a young lady in Canada, looking at satellite maps, found a brand new, undiscovered Mayan city in the jungle. 
We'll come back to that point shortly. The Mayans lived in 39 city-states. Your synth synthesis for this will be ancient Greece, the empire of Ghana over in West Africa, or even the great Zimbabwe. They all lived in these like city-state-like um, areas. Each city-state would have a large pyramid. Normally it was decorated in gold because the largest, most powerful object in Mesoamerica, as always, whether you're in Japan or Egypt or you're Louis XIV, it's the sun. And while the pyramids of Mesoamerica are only about half the size of the Great Pyramid of Cheops, they do have them. Standing directly opposite the pyramids of the sun, are going to be the pyramid of the moon. Smaller because the moon is a smaller object normally coated in silver. And there is a lot of elaborate stone carvings throughout the area. A lot of monumental art and architecture. Now the River Valley civilizations did the same thing. The Mayans just get a little bit later start because of the difference they had to travel. So they're about 50 and when 3,3200, when the Mesopotamians are inventing writing, Mayans hadn't even got started yet. It'll take them 1,500 years. So around 1,500, right about the time the Aryans get to ancient India, is when the Mayan culture is really going to take off. They have these large, giant stone heads that are extremely similar to carvings found in Easter Island and as far away as South Africa. Eerily um, resemblance there. Each city-state was ruled by a god-king, a king that was literally viewed as a living god. Big difference here, or excuse me, a similarity is, while the Mayans sometimes fought amongst themselves, all 39 city-states were ruled by one single dynasty, a family that stayed in power. If you were with us last night, you know the only other civilization that has had one single dynasty throughout its long history is Japan. Um, Japan. In the Mayans, there were actually two women kings who ruled for a small time as well. The city-states were laid out in a grid pattern, all roads pointing north and south and east and west. And in the middle, there was a giant square that had the religious buildings on one side and the governmental buildings on the other. Um, the city-states were linked through alliances. Um, they worked together in, in sometimes in warfare and sometimes in um, a trade alliance. And things that they traded, the always important in the ancient world, salt. Other things were flint, this hard you know, um, stone um, that could be used as a weapon or to start fire. And also colored feathers. The more colorful the feather, the more it was worth. The Mayans did not have a standard currency. And if you guys don't mind, I need to walk around a little bit or I'll just go completely totally insane. Um, the Mayans um, traded cocoa beans and chocolate as money. How nice might it be to have a Hershey bar as your form of currency? Crops that are native to the Americas and are extremely important is corn, maize, and corn was so expensive, he'll, he'll get it eventually. Corn was so revered, it was actually worshipped as like a god. There was a god of like corn. It can be prepared in many different ways. It's highly protein rich. Beans and squash. And these are three crops that are going to be transported later to Africa and Europe as part of the Columbian Exchange or transatlantic trade that will allow populations to completely and totally burst. Here is the um, temple of um, Tikal. Um, here it is from the overhead. It's not as wide as one of the Great Pyramids, 
but it is 212 feet tall at the center of one of the plazas in the city of um, Tikal. Um, here at P Palenique, um, you have the stairs going up in this little gutter running alongside was used to drain away blood. The thing that links the Mesoamerican civilizations will be some type of human sacrifice. The Mayans did not really sacrifice um, captives per se, as a rich noble person would cut their own arm and then um, drop it over the sacrifice to the gods because noble blood was worth more. When they did sacrifice you, they would take you up here, lay you on this table that's inscribed with the different gods, and the blood would soak through and then drain down, giving the god power. So that is prevalent through all, all Mesoamerican societies. And here's the big one. Um, chances are, if you go, you will go to um, Chichen Itza. Um, also showing up in the Mayan world, are the, is the ritual ball court, which was kind of a rugby, soccer, basketball, football, lacrosse, where you played in this stadium and you had to get a bladder, a ball, through this hoop about 20 feet off the ground. And it was anything goes um, as long as you won. The high priest would sit on one side of the court, the king on the other, and they had small satellite dishes carved into the backs <coughs> so they could turn and whisper and the sound would be broadcasted and they could communicate with each other. The winners were seen as heroes and they would be sacrificed. This was a good thing. And they would go down and help two heroes, the hero twins, who went to the underworld to defeat the bad forces, the evil forces of night. They were resurrected as um, the moon and the star Venus. So every year you wanted to go down and help out the hero twins in the Mayan Super Bowl. The social class system is the same as it is in virtually every um, civilization throughout time. You have the king and the high priest on top. Followed by the royal family and the assistant high priests in the temple. Then you've got the nobles, the governmental workers who kind of kept an eye on things. And then you had the highly skilled artisans and merchants. The two merchants that were the most dominant were goldsmiths and those who worked with obsidian or flint. On the very, 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 very bottom are the common farmers, as always, and slaves. Why do we use slaves? Well, slaves, just like they are anywhere else in the world, are prisoners of war. So they got to do the nasty, difficult labor. The Mayans, just like everybody else in the formative period, um, are polytheistic. They believed each day of the year was actually a living God. And they began to map out a famous calendar, which you guys probably have heard of. It is um, the Mayan calendar that predicts the end of the world in 2012. Yes, sir. Does that mean they worship a different God every single day? Yes. Is it like, like the sun is just like a big God? Like... They did have that, and each day was a miniature little junior if that makes sense, repetitively, over and over and over again, um, over again. So since they are worshiping a different god, they developed the highly accurate calendar, which the Europeans will eventually match up when they decide to um, colonize. The Mayans believe they owed a blood, a blood debt to the gods in return for being created. So their blood would satisfy the gods hence all the human um, sacrifice. So they also sent food, burnt offerings, and human sacrifices to nourish the gods. This is a limestone pool that they have threw human sacrificial victims into, precious metals. They're very hard to see, and because they're limestone, 
Um, there's like drainage tunnels, like tides affect them, the ocean. And when you jump in, you can be, many divers have been lost being sucked in to these um, side tunnels. Um, there's gold down there, there's jade, there's idols. It hasn't been excavated because it is a burial site and the Mexican government does not smile upon that. Yes, sir. I thought you had a um, question. All right. The Mayans, to develop the calendar, were extremely good at mathematics. Just like the Greeks building the Parthenon and the Egyptians building the pyramids and the Renaissance artists um, like Leonardo da Vinci, they used the ratio of the golden mean to have perfectly balanced and perspective art and architecture. And using their math skills, they broke down the year to 365.2 days, which is almost, if you look at it, an exact duplicate of the Roman calendar in which we use. So highly knowledgeable at mathematics. Mayans have two calendars. The biggest one is the outer circle. You may um, have seen this. It is the face of the coin in the famous um, Jack Sparrow, Johnny Depp movies. There's also a giant one of it at the Epcot Center in Disney World if you go into um, Mexico. And so you have a solar calendar, one circle, and then an inner circle, which is a lunar calendar, a 206-day lunar calendar where we have a difference of 13 months in the lunar calendar and 18 months in the solar calendar. The, the months were a little bit shorter than ours, about 20 days. At the end of the year, there were five days left over at the end. So the Mayas, much like us, at the end of the year, instead of having New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, they had a week-long festival to the gods. But the Mayan calendar forms the infinity symbol, a figure eight. So people say, oh, the Mayan calendar is going to end in 2012. Well, it forms the infinity symbol. So it wasn't going to end. It just resets itself. Silly weirdos burying like Jim Beam in their backyard. That's all right. The Mayas have, you know, people have done that. The Mayas have this, James is like we did. Sorry, James. <laughs> all right. All right. The Mayans um, developed a highly complex writing system of 800 glyphs, like the Egyptian hieroglyphics. So a lot of similarities between the Egyptians and the Mayas. And they recorded their events on paper, and they called it a codex. A codex was the catalog. It was the, the code to understanding the Mayan writing, like a computer codex, or if you've seen the Superman movie before the Batman Superman one, well, the codex of Kryptonian civilization was embedded in Superman's DNA. It's where all the secrets are. Unfortunately, we have not been able to piece together the Mayan codex. It was destroyed during Spanish conquest. Only recently, we have found bits and pieces and are trying to recreate and understand the Mayan writing. So we still do not know a lot about them as a result of that we fact. Can't yes. still, like, read Mayan? We cannot read Mayan. Okay. We cannot. Yes. So going there, we can read Egyptian hieroglyphics. We cannot read Mayan. We're still working on it. So Nicolas Cage in National Treasure 2, great movie. His mom couldn't translate mine because we don't have a Rosetta Stone yet. So, anyway. Um, it may be orally spoken in parts, but there's the writing we don't, okay. we don't know. So, anyway. Um, so, um, what we do know has been translated into Spanish. So, the New World bears a heavily Spanish bias because virtually everything we know comes from the lens and the descriptions of the Spanish um, conquistadors. In the late 8900s, between the time of Charlemagne reigning, the Treaty of Verdun that his idiot grandsons um, drew up, and during the giant spread of Islam across the world, 
during the empire of Ghana in West Africa, the Mayan civilization, very similar to Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, just mysteriously disappears. We don't really know why, but all of their great cities are abandoned. We don't know if it was a plague, if there was warfare, some type of famine and trade disruption, but everything is gone. Um, don't know if it was overpopulation, environmental damage, we don't know, but the Mayas, poof, are gone. And by the time the few Mayans um, that were still left, when the conquistadors showed up, they were totally weak, they could not defend themselves, and were highly susceptible to European diseases, and they just die off. That's it for the Mayans. Next up is the more famous of the Mesoamerican civilizations, the Aztecs. And we are going to do to the AP World Exam what the Aztecs did to a lot of surrounding people. We are going to kick some Aztec. There we go. All right. Aztecs are going to be in their heyday 12 to 1400. So in the high Middle Ages through the Renaissance is when the Aztecs are going to be that 300 year period where they're uber powerful. And they were nomadic warriors, very simply, similar to the Seljuk Turks over in the Ottoman Empire. They were asked to be the warrior wing of a group known as the Toltecs. And then they sat around and said, why are we working for them when we should be in charge of this unit? So they take over. And they are an extractive empire, very similar to Rome, where they conquered you and they exacted tribute. You had to pay them your stuff. So as a result, the Aztecs become a highly militarized society. The only thing we can compare it to throughout world history is ancient Sparta, where every male was to expected to be in the army. The officers were sent to special, special OCS, officer candidate schools, and they were the military leaders, where the peasants were the foot soldiers. Question, Ben? No. No? However, Aztec society was mobile. The better warrior you were, the more wealth you could acquire, the better you could do. And your rank in society whether you were like the table of ranks drawn up by uh, Peter the Great and the Ottoman Empire, the more colorful your regalia was, the more successful of a warrior, the higher your rank in social privileges. But being an Aztec noble was very difficult. Punishments and rules of behavior on the nobles were much harsher than those on peasants because nobles Excellent warriors are supposed to know better. So you had to be role models like a Confucian scholar. The goal of the Aztecs was not to kill warriors that they fought against, but to capture them because no civilization in world history depended much upon human sacrifice, as did the Aztecs. They believed the sun would not rise the next day unless fed by the blood of sacrificial victims. So a great comparison for the Aztecs is Rome. Their extraction, we know from records from the conquistadors that they required tribute states 7,000 tons of corn, 2 million cloaks, the conquered people in that green shaded area gave the Aztecs everything. There are drawn written records of all the tribute that must be handed over to the Aztecs. They didn't want to conquer everywhere because if they did, they would run out of sacrificial victims. So we would conquer Raiderville. All right, we would capture all the young men and take and kill them, and we'd leave the five, ten-year-old young boys. Then 10, 15 years later, when they had grown up in adults, we would come back and get them. Um, 
And your success as a warrior was how many captives you brought back alive to be sacrificed. Are we paying attention, Alexander? No, I am. It's okay if you're here because your mom's making no, it. No, no, so I'm here because I have to learn. All right, I got you. So you're, you're, you're a better warrior by how many sacrifices, how many people you capture. Excellent. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> well done. The capital city is one of the engineering marvels of the ancient world. A lot of time people focus only on the militaristic accomplishments of the Aztecs. But here in Lake Texcoco, Ben and Ben, um, we have the floating city of Tenochtitlan that's um, tethered to the mainland by these causeways or bridges that can be pulled away if the Aztecs were attacked. And running into them are freshwater aqueducts from the mountains bringing fresh water into the central city. When Cortez looked at it, he's like, my God, we don't have anything like this back in Europe. Cadiz and Sevilla are no match for Tenochtitlan. It was the Venice of the New World. And then Cortez said, oh boy, look at this. There's a beautiful floating city covered in gold in a lake. Let's go, let's go trash it. Woo! All right, excellent, Hernando. Um, what shocked him was the amount of people that went to the market every single day. 60,000 people traveled by canoe and waterway to get everything from clothes to food to supplies. It was like a giant Sam's Club or Super Walmart. 60,000 people a day, for those of you who were downtown on Franklin Street when the um, championship was won, that was about 55,000 people. Imagine that going to the store every single day. An incredible technological achievement. And don't get me started on my favorite thing of the Aztecs are the... The chinapas. The chinapas. All right? I like the floating baskets of food. I wish that they would make a dish called a chinampa because I would order it just because it sounds like it would really be really good. Like, oh, two chinampas, please. All right, you know, <laughs> you know with beef. All right, so anyway, all right, yeah, you know, so, all right, the religion as we know is based on human sacrifice and the blood powers the sun. Um, we didn't believe it for years, but it was scientifically proven that during a massive famine working around the clock, the Aztecs were able to extract and cut out a human heart um, in just a few seconds, and they, they sacrificed between 20 and 30,000 victims in one day. The government, very similar to Sparta, was very authoritarian and hierarchical. It was like a table of ranks, again, in the Ottomans and for Peter the Great. General, Colonel, Major, Captain, Lieutenant. There was a strict chain of command. And just like, you know, um, ancient Rome, there were two social classes. There were the patricians, the nobles, and then there were the plebeians, the commoners. And everything was color-coded. You could not wear colorful regalia that was not of your social class. You simply and totally just could not do it. It was um, forbidden. Um, but, like few other societies at the time, you could raise your social status in the Aztec world if you needed to. Here is the flint or the obsidian knife that I passed around and showed you. And, you know, Ben was telling James that you could just lay it and rub it across your skin and you see that white mark. It's like sharp glass. Um, the Aztecs, you know, had metal, but it was gold or silver, so they used the obsidian or flint for their tools, and they could use this short knife, cut out the heart. Here is, um, you know, the big blood red complex, one of the temples where they sacrificed the victims at the rate of 20 to 30,000 in one single day. As I said, it's the Spider-Man philosophy, with great power comes great responsibility. So the nobles had to behave better. Standards of behavior and conduct were much, much higher for them. 
The empire was highly organized. They had enormous HOAs, like some of the neighborhood Nazis that you have in your um, neighborhoods. And the neighborhoods were divided into kapuli. And a kapuli is like, like your neighborhood or a big city block where, like in New York City at, you know, um, the heyday of immigration, there was the Polish neighborhood and the Jewish neighborhood and the Italian neighborhood and the Irish neighborhood. Everything was gridded off. And your whole life revolved around the Kapuli. You went to church there, you went to school there, you grocery shop there, you played with the kids there. Like Lake Hogan kids don't play with Wexford kids because there's a big rivalry. You know, Claremont does not mix with like anybody. They're in their own world. You know, Camden Place versus Homestead Village in the Highlands. Larkspur versus like Parkside, like I don't even know. All right, but you know, you stay, that's it, James, flash your gang sign. Uh, anyway. And there were Kapuli um, officials who made sure the, the, the boys were being educated. You did your military training in your neighborhood, um, your mandatory military service, and the taxes were collected. It was highly regimented and organized. Women in the Aztec world had high social status, unlike most women in the world at the time. They could conduct business, they could speak in court, they were able to inherit property, and the pains of childbirth were equated to the stress of combat. So the more child children women had, the higher their social rank. So that Mrs. Duggar, from the 29 children and counting, I'm eternally pregnant, would be like superwoman in the um, Aztec world. Raquel, if I keep getting in your way, just tell me to move, dude, I'm sorry. All right. The Aztec civilization will end. They reach their high point just barely 100 years before Cortez and the conquistadors show up and they destroy not only Tenochtitlan, but they wipe away because of social Darwinism. We were talking about it at lunch today. An entire ancient world cart culture with monumental architecture, specialized language, religion, technological and cultural achievement. It was wiped away because it wasn't Spanish. Right, you guys good with the Incas? All right. The Incas. Um, same time frame as the Aztecs primarily, and they hit their heyday when P Prince Henry is beginning to navigate, and just like the Aztecs, they reached a high point of their civilization about a hundred years before the Spanish show up. But over here, we're down in South America now on the west coast, Chile, Peru, Peru and Ecuador, and there is some, a foundational empire down there, just like the Olmecs of Mexico. And we have the great Nazca Lines, who on the plains of Peru drew these, like there's the big spider, there's the monkey, and this chicken creature. You can only see them from very high up in the air. Um, so they were not discovered until, you know, a little over um, 100 years ago. I think they even made an appearance in the Transformer movies, one of the Transformer movies, if I'm not mistaken. I don't really know. They all kind of blend together and all sound the um, same to me. So it is the um, Moche or the Nazca that form the bedrock foundation in South America. All of their stuff will be blended into what we know as the Incan Empire. And what separates the Incas is their territory is bordered on the high, rugged Andes Mountains. So the air is very thin. It's oxygen deprived. There's a bunch of volcanic activity. And so you get high up in the Andes Mountains here, and you're looking over Lake Titicaca, a big, you know, giant lake in Bolivia. And so you've got these dry, arid, snow-capped mountains. And then you go into cold, arid desert. And the civilizations will exist in these valleys where um, the Incan villages are going to live. 
And so a lot of mudslides, and if there's any earthquakes, it's going to smash the people in the bottoms of these valleys. So the Incas have got to become very thrifty and intelligent when adapting that, that geography. Yes, sir? Is there a reason why they chose to like, settle on that because of that place? Yes, because at the bottom of these mountains was the only area, great question, where the soil had gathered enough where they could farm and grow agriculture. Doing it up on the mountains was impossible, so they had to live down in the valley, even though it was dangerous and flooding. Think of it like Egypt and Mesopotamia back in the river, river valley days. You guys may remember this. Everyone loves the movie. It's not one of my favorite. The Emperor's New Groove, oh, or so the good. Emperor Becomes a Llama. <laughs> it's so okay, it's super like good. It. It's okay, but it's not. The Emperor is a straight it. moron, okay. and he annoys the crap out of me. So anyway, um, what's that? He's not. Yeah, okay, I guess. You know, is that the guy that helps him, or is he the bodyguard? He's the bodyguard. Right, he's even dumber, but that's okay. So hey, if you like a camera, we're good. All right, yeah. All right. Matter of fact, for you, Cameron, there's a slide of the Emperor's new group. There we go. All right. Early Incas, 1200s. Um, they start in a small village and it eventually grows into the giant city of Cusco or the city of four corners where the north and the south and the east-west trade routes meet. Think of it as the South American version of Mecca or Timbuktu over in West um, Africa. Um, in the late or mid early 1400s powerful Incan ruler Makuti will take the throne here he is right here, and he will begin to go on a voyage of conquest. But the Incas conquered much different than most other empires and civilizations. They would roll down and ask you, hey, do you want to be enrolled into our empire? And if you said no, they would build a Sam's Club warehouse of all the trade goods in their empire and have you walk through it. Look, if you hang out with us, you can trade and have access to all this stuff. And if that didn't work, then they would come in and use force and military conquer you. But it was normally a last resort. Much like Nebuchadnezzar, for the most part, and Alexander the Great, they allowed people to keep their own local customs and rulers in exchange for loyalty. Life here can go on as it always had. You're just going to give us soldiers, pay us taxes, and acknowledge me as your leader. If you cause trouble, let's say you lived high in the Andes Mountains and you were troublemakers, the Incas would force you to leave the mountains and go live down in the rainforest of the Amazon River Valley. They would remove you from your area where you were comfortable. So they would force you to learn new skills to adapt. Hopefully you were so busy learning to adapt to your new civilization, you wouldn't have time to cause um, any trouble. The Incas will build great works. The giant city of Machu Picchu right there. Another picture of it is right here on the National Geographic map on the wall. This giant city high up near 11,000 feet. Some people need to acclimate when they go to um, Machu Picchu. you got to give your body the ability so you don't get altitude sickness. So how do they get the stones and the architecture to build this beautiful city on a cliffside? Um, shows you how good of engineers they were. Their empire is going to be more long and thin than it is fat, covering about 2,500 miles, so most of the length of the United States, encompassing about 16 million people. So in its heyday, it was the largest, most dominant um, em well, empire in the um, New World. Um, the um, Incas um, are going to link it. This is kind of this is bizarre. Why are this a duplicate slide? I don't know. Anyway, they built this elaborate road system. Think of the Great Royal Road in Persia or the Roman Road Network 
Um, they carve steps into the mountain sides and it runs along the cliff side high above the clouds. This guy here, I was praying he didn't fall off so I didn't have to try and, and save him. Some of them are only two, three feet wide, but they had a series of runners known as Chotskys, cross country runners. We have, you know, Raquel in here. And their job was to deliver messages back and forth linking the great Incan um, empire. Um, speed, communication, trade, and military goods were able to survive on this road. And every five or six miles they had relay stations so you would run, hand off your Pony Express mail, and the next person would start um, hauling. Um, the government like any, any good authoritarian government controlled all aspects of your life. A large empire needs strict central um, efficiency. And every person had to pay taxes in the form of labor tribute, which will become known as the Mita system. The Mita system is when Every person has to do a certain number of days of, of labor per year. Maybe building or maintaining those roads, fixing a new bridge, clearing out forests, digging an, an irrigation canal, whatever. They were public works projects. So you did your 40 days a year um, in service, then the rest of the year you were free to do your job. And so they rotated it every 40 days, and you knew it when it was coming. They didn't just throw it on you. And the Incas, as far as we know, did not use a currency system. Everything was state-run and governed. Their achievements, there are the Chotskys, the little guys, you know, running. The rope bridges connect the vast chasms and river valleys. The rope suspension bridge of um, thick-bound ropes and then smaller ropes and tree branches interlaced and woven um, to cross gorges and streams. They're very bouncy, like the bridge um, up on Grandfather Mountain. I don't know if you guys have done it, but like I'm that dad when my kids are on it. I start jumping up and down. Oh, God, man, we're going to fall. No, you're not. But anyway, um, I think there's a sign now that says don't do that, but whatever. Um, anyway, yes, sir. How can they travel in their home? The one person did the runners from beginning to end. Everybody so would you see, like, yeah, you would run five, six it's, miles. It's like get a message across. Yes, yeah, not one person could do it. Five, yeah, it it well, you handed it off. Oh, yeah, oh, it was like it was like a, it was it was like a, a, a baton. So Raquel out there practicing her handoffs yesterday. <laughs> if you missed that handoff, that sucker like rolled off the mountain. You were. Yeah, you were jumping yeah. off the net. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you would both have to. Who was talking about? Like, I don't know. Yeah. What? what? You know, it's those deleted emails or whatever. I don't know. All right. So, um, anyhow, the biggest accomplishment of the Incas is, as Ben asked earlier, why in God's name are they living down here surrounded by these mountains? Well, because the soil always washed down, they began to use that terraced agriculture. We know that the kingdom of Axum did that. Other people did it to keep their crops from washing off the mountain. They cut this intricate series of steps, and even they made kind of like this, you know, um, sink drain or toilet bowl. So when things washed down, they would collect in there, and they would still grow. Terraced farming, heavy labor intensive, but it allows the civilization um, to flourish. One of the reasons why Mesoamerica never developed the wheel is they did not have large beasts of burden. Everything had to be pretty much done by human labor because alpacas and llamas, as nice as they are, didn't really carry heavy loads. When the Spanish showed up with horses and like cows, the Aztecs said, oh my God, they're riding large, enormous dogs. Well, it happened to be a horse. All right. The Incas will never develop writing, but they will record their information on large <laughs> strands of like leather, rope, or even gold, and they will use different colored beads or knots. 
the knots or the beads meant different things. And so the example I gave you of there would be a green bead, a yellow bead, a blue bead, another yellow, another blue, another yellow, and then another green. Based on the knots in those beads, that would mean that the ink has traveled for three days over water, getting point to point. That's just what we think. We are not sure, but that seems to be our best guess. So think of it as the ink inversion of a Chinese um, abacus. So, let's see. Ah, yes. Um, the Incas, is this the Aztecs? What are they doing here? Uh, uh. Ah, no. Um, yes. Just like the Mayas and the um, Aztecs, the sun god is um, always the most um, important. The Sapa Inca was seen as pretty much as a living god, so much so that the Sapa Inca never wore the same pair of clothes twice. There are a group of ladies, the Mamaconas or the Makunas, who their job was to make him clothes and brew a ceremonial beer known as chicha. If you go to, um, down there today, you can get chicha. It's made of corn. It's colored like blue, like blue Kool-Aid. A lot of people think it's good. I'm not an enormous fan. The Incas also participated in human sacrifice, but nowhere near the scale of our um, Aztec friends. The one crazy thing about the Incas is when their leaders died, um, they were treated as if they were still alive. They would be wrapped up like Egyptian mummies in a seated position, and they would be given food every day and important festivals. They would be carried out as like they were someone coming to celebrate. Why that is? Absolutely no idea. And is it creepy? Yeah. Yes. All right. But that was their, that was their deal. All right. Um, Temple of the Sun, blah, 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 um, was decorated in gold um, because it was the tears um, of the sun. The Incas don't have as much gold as there was in Mexico, but a lot of silver. So Francisco Pizarro is going to roll into town in 1532 and dominate the area for Spain because of the um, silver trade. This is um, an ancient building that was part of a, um, the, the foundation is a religious center that was destroyed by the Spanish and turned into a fort. It was one of the like country club estates where the rich Incans would go and hang out. It was like their um, country club. So Machu Picchu was only discovered 105, 106 years ago. So anyway. Here's a look at the massive geographic terrain and a good shot of the terraced farming um, in Machu Picchu. And this is what the town looks like. I mean, very good, solid construction, which means somebody organized that labor, organized all the building materials, and had them build that sucker way up there. And all those rocks had to be carried up there. So that was some hardcore work. Um, the Incas reached their height just before the Spanish show up, and much like the British instigating fights between different Indian empires, there was a civil war between Aflupa and his brother Huscar over who was going to be the um, ruler. The entire civilization was forced to pick sides, and it is Aflupa who is captured by Pizarro, and he puts 